word this morning. I feel like God really wants to do something special today. I felt all the way from this morning that God wants us to be instant, ready to receive what He has today. I mean, no, we can go too fast for God sometimes. And God will just sit back on the throne and say, well, just give him, do your thing. But he loves it when we take our time and we worship him. And spend time in worship. And I believe he really wants to do something special. How many need something from God this morning? How many don't need anything from God? Okay, that's the better way to say it. Some of you just don't want to raise your hand. So I know I need something from God this morning. I came here for that very reason. I mean, no, God will never leave you wanting. He will always fulfill the needs that you have. Sing this to him now. You are worthy. Come on now. Yeah. 
mwezi kutoka So we got three here. Anybody else? All right, we want you to join in with us. Some of you that want to pray and pray with us, come on up here.
worthy is your name. I don't know about you, but I came today for a reason. Some folks come to church because it's just a thing to do. And they feel better on Monday if they go to church on Sunday. But I come on Sunday so that I can receive. And today I want to receive something. I give to God everything, and guess what? He gives back to me. And today is your day to receive. And I believe you're going to receive something today, something special. God has something special for you today. And I believe He's going to speak to you in His way. And how many know he's, He knows how to speak to you? He knows how to talk to you. See, pastor can say some things that you may say, oh, that's pretty good. But when God speaks, you go, oh, yeah, you're right, God. God knows how to speak to us. And he will speak to you today. I believe that with all my heart. Take your neighbor by the hand as we pray. And God, I just thank you today. I thank you for your anointing power. And I thank you, Lord, that you have visited us today. And you're here with us today. And Father, I just... I just want to do the best that I can, Lord, to lead and guide into a, a, a spirit, Lord, as we get ready to take communion, Father. I just ask you right now, God, that you just reach down from heaven, God, and you just do what needs to be done today. Lord, move in a mighty way. God, you've already touched us and you've already moved. And God, you've already done some miracles this morning. And God, right now, I just thank you for what you've already done. But God, we're looking forward, God, to what you're going to do in the remainder of this service. Lord, as Keith comes and, and leads us into uh, our communion, Father, we just ask that you bless it in a special way. And God, everything after that, God, we just know you'll have your hand on it. And God, everyone that leaves this place today, God, we want them to leave saying it's been good to be in the house of God. And Lord, that they'll be strengthened to move down the road, Lord, as they go through life. But God, we just thank you. We give you praise and everything in your precious name. Amen and amen. If you believe that, say amen. amen. We're going to ask our guys to get together. Can you come on up? And you may be seated. We're going to take a minute here and do communion. God, we're so good.
for each and every one of us, and yes. he knows the torture, the pain that he went through. Yes. None of us has ever gone through that, but we, we complain at times, but what our Lord Jesus did for us, yet while we're still sinners, he died for us. I would ask if you do have that today of representing the body of our Lord. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before this morning, we do truly thank you that we have we can't have communion, but let's do it in the remembrance of thee, because it is thee that we remember when we take this communion, what you have done for us. We will give you the praise, we will give you the glory and the honor for it. Yes. Amen. Take it here. <laughs> Likewise, I ask you to hold up the cup. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before this morning, we truly thank you for this, that we're about to partake of the juice that represents the blood that you shed for us, the atonement of our sins, the atonement that you did it for us, that we, we can have eternal life, and we can have the, that intimate relationship with you and just serve you, and what a, what a reward we're going to have for serving you. But you died, you shed your blood, you were beaten, you were tortured. Let us take this in remembrance of you, because you are Christ our King, our Lord, our Lord, and Master, in your precious holy name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Isn't God good?
got two birthdays. One was, he's not here, is he, John, last night? But we have another one. He answers this week.
Are we having a who's running the children's church today? You are. Sister Dana's gonna go in the back back there. We're gonna dismiss all the kids right now. Oh, she's in trouble again. Everybody wishes to be good luck. Praise the Lord. Stand in front one more time. Remind your neighbor, look at him and say, God's got something good for you. Don't say this to him. Don't let it go. All right. I want you to put your hands together. I want you to welcome our youth pastor. And he is... Uh, been a good help to us in all kinds of different ways, but today he is bringing forth the message, and I want you to just put your hands together and give him some encouragement. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great, I gotta live up to something. <laughs> well, you that heard me last time know that it's not gonna be real hard. Morning. Morning. Guess what? God loves you. Amen. Amen, indeed. Um, you know, last time I was up here, I, I was talking about having. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Hang on. How do you press ignore? Okay, it's a new phone. I'm sorry. Okay, last time I was up here, I was talking to y'all about um, you know the garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's going to be a tough room. Dave's enjoying that just a little too much. I'm glad he's in the back. Now I've lost my train of thought. All right, hold on there. You do me a favor. Just, I don't know how to kill it. Just hold on to it for me, buddy. Wow. That's embarrassing, isn't it? I don't know how you shut it off, dude. So. Again? Just shut it off. Because it'll be your horse. Throw up your phone. Wait a minute. church. Oops, excuse me a second. I know, man. I'm on the in front of the church right now. I know, right? I came up with that's kind of weird. 
A um, couple people that I've talked to this week kind of have an understanding of what I'm coming from with this. And basically it's out of Romans. So we're going to be going to Romans. If y'all have your Bibles, you can go to Romans and I'll kind of give you the lead in here. This has really been on my heart this week. And this has been a tough week because even up until this morning, I just felt this overwhelming spirit moving and it, it's saying this is again what what I want you to talk about and, and this is how I want you to put things and this is stuff that needs to be said and you know and I'm not a pastor and in front of a church that can be taken the wrong way it can be taken as uh, you know who are you to tell me you know what, what are you telling me for you know, maybe the pastor should be telling me that and things but you know I truly believe that God puts people in positions to talk to people and you either obey that or you don't obey that and a title doesn't make uh, a title doesn't make you what you are. It's God that makes you what you are. Amen. Yeah. So what I'd like to do is open up in a prayer. So um, and then we're going to do something right after that. So let's bow our heads and just open in prayer. Father God, we just ask for your words to be here today. Lord, we ask that this be about you, not about me. Let it be your message, not about what I have to say. Let people hear it with open hearts. Father God, we just love you, and we know that uh, that you're here. We know that you're here every week. We know that you're here when we're not, and we know that you're here when we are weak. And we love you, and we thank you for that, Father. And we just pray that we would receive this message today, and Lord, that it would be from you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, one more thing. Let's bow our heads for a second. Again, this is not a prayer, so just close your eyes or bow your heads wherever you're at. I don't want to embarrass anybody. This is going to be a big deal, all right? Um, if you feel that right now you're doing everything in your life that God has called you to do, raise your hand. <coughs> So nobody, and this is not embarrassing because nobody did it, nobody feels like you're doing everything that God has called you to do, right? So there's more. There's something else that he's calling us to do. Okay, you guys can open, guys. Thanks. Let's open with Romans 12. And I'm going to go ahead and read through this. Because God gives us things, right? He gives us talents and he gives us purpose. And he gives us, you know, when you're a kid and you're going, everyone's going, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you're like, I don't know. Maybe a fireman. That's cool. I might be a cop. You know, I don't know. I want to do something something interesting, something that, that you have that fire for, you know, you have that passion. As a kid, what is that? As a kid, you don't really know what that is. So Romans 12, 12, 6 is what we're going to start with all through 8. So here we go. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophecy, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. And if it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. And if it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. So God says that we have talents, but he doesn't always come right out and say, this is what your talent is. This, this is what you should be doing. When you're eight years old and people are asking you, what are you, what do you want to do when you grow up? You really don't have that answer, right? I mean, you don't know. I want to color. I want to play outside. I want to ride my bike. That'd be cool if I ride my bike for a living. That'd be kind of weird. 44 years old riding a bike for a living. That'd be cool if you put me in the circus or something. It'd be cool. But he gives us all different passions, right? Like your passion was going to be completely different even from the person maybe that you're dating or that you're married to. And your passion is completely different, but it's there. You've got something inside of you that God is saying use, right? What is it? How do I find it? Is there anybody here that really isn't sure? And this is not an embarrassing question. Sometimes I'm not sure. Is there anybody else with me that doesn't always know what God wants for your life? I mean, you go one direction and you think, this is it. This is where I'm going. I'm going to do this thing. And then God says, in some fashion, that's really not what I have in mind for you. So how do you do that? How do you figure that out? I don't know. That's tough. I think what you have to do is you have to understand what God does when he puts a passion in your heart. So I made some notes here, okay? Um, music has always been my passion. Music is not always Mary Margaret's passion. And so after a Sunday or, or we get together with friends and we do, we play or something, I'm always fired up. I'm like, man, did you hear Ray? Did you hear Dina? Did you hear that drum thing we were doing? That thing was rocking. And she's like, yeah, you want to go steak and shake? 
I'm like, we're talking about, we rocked it, we were moving, it was, God was there, it was awesome. She's not, it's not that she doesn't back me up, it's not that she doesn't understand that I have that passion in my heart, it's just that I have a lot more um, uh, excitement for that particular thing than she does. That's hard for me. And I'm going to tell you what, when I started thinking about what I wanted to talk about, the thing that kept coming to my brain was judgment. And then the other thing was, what am I going to do about the rest of my life? Well, that's kind of a heavy subject, you know? So, how am I going to tie these things together? And so God shut off my filter. You know that filter that you have? When like someone's like, like, hey man, how you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. You're going, crappy, thanks. That's not the filter. The filter's off. The filter's sort of like, oh, I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'm doing great. You know, how are you doing? You know, or somebody, God forbid, would ask you at that point, what do you think about something? Because it's like, when your filter's off, man, if you don't want to know, you better not ask that person what they think. You know what I'm saying? You do. You're laughing because it's happened or something. You know? You've been there and, like, the person that you're, you're like, talking to or whatever is like, you know, uh, you're going, man, I just bought these new shoes. Do you like them? They're like, yeah, what do you pay for this? You're like, I only paid 10 bucks. I'm like, you overpaid, man. What the ugly shoes I've ever seen. <laughs> you're like, well, you either rebate or something. But, dude, don't wear those to church because they're going to throw you out. And then we're going to wash your feet in those shoes. And then you go, oh, man, I'm not doing it. Dude, I'm, so, I'm sorry. My filter was off. Let me turn my filter back on and ask the same question. How do you like those shoes? Those are some beautiful shoes, Mary Catherine. I love those. I know they're flip flops. Those rock. I love those. But in your brain, you're going. Oh, you really wore those. I'm not saying that. I'm not. You know how much counseling I'm gonna have to pay for when they grow up. And I'm gonna be going. It's your fault. Okay. God will give you certain things when he's trying to get your attention for your calling. He's going to give you a passion for something. He's going to put it in you, and there's no way you're going to ignore it. You're going to say, I'm going to find a way to do that no matter what it takes. If your passion is singing, you're going to find a way to sing. If it's playing music, he will put you in a place where you can play music. I've loved music my whole life and never played consistently with anybody until I started doing it for God and started doing it here. That's one year ago. That's 44 years. That's not an ugly thing. That's just saying that even though Rob kept saying, man, I'd love to play in a band. Man, I'd love to get better. I mean, honestly, people, and this is the honest to goodness truth. If you think I don't know that I'm not the best drummer in the world, you're wrong. But if God told me that you're going to play drums and you can't keep a beat to save your life, he's going to put me in a position where I'm going to play drums. And if somebody else comes along that's better and I need to step aside, I better be ready to do that because that's what God wants. So it's not about me when I say that. What I'm saying is that if you have something in your heart that you want to do, that you feel like God's putting there, you have to really kind of discern between, is that something God is telling me, or am I trying to put myself in the boat where I can do that regardless of what God wants me to do? If I put Mary Margaret on the drums and said, play these because God said so, she's going to say, first of all, you ain't the pastor, I don't have to listen to you. And those are lovely shoes. <laughs> The other thing he has to do is he has to give you, he has to give you the ability to carry out that passion. But he wouldn't put it in your heart if you didn't have the ability. How many people do you know that say, man, I'd love to do that? I was having lunch with a, a good friend. And it was right before I was going to talk this last time. And he said, man, I'd love to get up there in front of people. I would. I'd love to do that, but I just don't know. I don't know the Bible well enough. I don't know Scripture well enough. I'm not good in front of people. I don't want to get up there and talk. I don't want to do this. I don't, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I can do it. Let me tell you something, brother, and you know who I'm talking to. If God tells you you can do it, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And you're going to be able to do it because God's going to put that in you, and you're going to be able to do it. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'd rather listen to a guy up here that has that kind of spirit than one that can read this entire Bible to me and not understand one word what it really means. That means more to me than anything. Because I know God told him to do that. You need to understand that God's not going to give you a way to do anything until you open a personal relationship with God. 
He's not just going to take somebody. Let's, let's take like this. Joe runs a business. He doesn't put a sign out in front of the street and say, come and work for me, and never talk to that person, I wouldn't think. There's got some kind of interview process working here, right? You interview, you get to know them a little bit, and you decide if that person's right to work for you. God's kind of got that same concept, doesn't he? Is he just going to drop one of you in the middle of something that you're not equipped to handle and say, I want you to do it, I want you to do it well, and you better not screw it up, because if you do, I won't be very upset. If he did, we'd be, if he did, I'd be preaching. <laughs> right over everybody's head then. Pitch! That's just a little too much laughter back there. It's right over there. That's right again. Yeah, the other thing is, if you think that when I was. <laughs> I'm <talking about> <laughs> You have to know God personally. You have, you have to get in a relationship with Him for Him to understand who you are and for you to understand, more importantly, who He is. He cannot use you unless you allow Him to use you. You can be resistant. Just because God says, you're going to play music, you're going to preach, you're going to be in children's ministry, Joe, you're going to run a business, you're going to do this, you're going to do this, doesn't mean that we do it. And sometimes we say, I'm not doing that. Don't tell me what I'm going to do. This is my life. Right? A personal relationship with Christ means that it's not your life anymore. You're going to use it for God's purpose. Use it for what He wants you to do. I'm going to tell you something. If He wants you to do it, one way or another, it may take 44 years, you're going to do it. The difference is, when you know Christ is your Savior, you want to do it. You're, you're not fighting it. You're not saying, I want to do that. You're saying, what can I do? How much more? You're not going to say, man, God, you know, I'm doing enough. You know, hey, let me shut my phone off. Quit calling me. You know, you're going to be like, man, is God called? Watch it. God might call. I'm kidding, man. He's not going to call my phone. I gave him another number. You might want to shut your phone off. Now. Pay attention to who God made you out to be. You know how when you're again, you go back to when you're little and you think, man, you know, what are we going to do when we grow up? I mean, you don't really sit around and think about it. But people ask you. So it's hard not to think about it. What do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? What do you want to go to school? Where do you want to go to college? How much money do you want to make? How far do you want to drive? I don't know. I'm nine years old. I'm a kid. I don't want to do any of that. Working doesn't sound like much fun. <laughs> And so you've got all these, you've got all these influences going. You should be a physician because you got that touch. And you, 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 you should wash cars because you, you're the best dog on window cleaner I've ever seen in my life. And and Joey, you, you should be a chair sitter. And then you should get up and sell them because I've never seen anybody talk to people like you can. As soon as you're on, brother, you're on. You're talking to people. I buy a chair. What I'm saying is these things influence us as far as, you know, who, who are you? Who are you in God? Sometimes we have to step away from our lives. We have to look away from things. And if you know me, you understand that when I talk and when I preach like this, it's because I'm preaching to me. I mean, these are things that I, you know, it's not like I'm looking at it from an outside source. These are things that I've been dealing with. You know, when God shuts my filter off, it's like, it kind of takes you away from yourself. Because you kind of realize what a jerk you can really be without God. That's kind of harsh, but isn't it, isn't it kind of true? Not that I'm a jerk, I mean, you guys are really like a little too quick. The other one. The world can make us whatever it wants to be. It can make us whatever it wants us to be. The world can twist us and turn us and tell us that we're no good until we believe it. And then guess what we're going to do for God? Nothing. We're not going to do anything. Unless we want to do it. And that's just not what he's got in mind for us, guys. The message that's been on my heart all week is that time is short. 
It is very short. And, and Pastor Tim talked about this last night. It's amazing how in sync this whole thing was between what he wanted to preach on last night and what I came to him and said what I wanted to preach on. And some of the even stuff that's coming out of his mouth today is, is written down here that I wanted to say. There's, there's a lot of work to do. And if we're still running around trying to figure out what it is we want to do when we grow up, it's not going to get done. It's never going to get done. We're just going to be standing around when we're 75 going, shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? Like the song. The other thing God will do is He'll make a way. He'll, he'll give us the passion. He'll put it in our hearts. He'll give us the ability and He'll make a way to do it. He'll open a door. He's not just going to do that if we're not seeking it. Let's pray on it, pray on it, pray on it. What do you want me to be doing? Do you have that heart? Do you want to do something for God? Again, this isn't this isn't a normal message for me. Normally, I'm up here dancing around and all goofy and I'm on the phone. I'm still kind of goofy, but man, this is just weighing on me this week. It's like 2,000 years. See, the the argument I always hear from other people, and it's other people who want to argue the fact that there's work to be done, is, hey, it's been 2,000 years. We live an average of 77 years. I'm 40. That's 37 years. I got plenty of time. Yes, if you want to accomplish only this much, if you want to just get by, there's plenty of time to just get by. That's the donut guy. I'll explain that. I promise. But that's the donut guy. This one really is kind of hard to get through. Something that just breaks my heart when I'm talking to people. And we're talking about talking about what you can do for God. Especially when it comes from children. Because you know children will their kids are sponges. They don't just come up with stuff. They they absorb it and they repeat it back at you. So when you hear a child say this to you, it really just kind of grips me, you know? And I think, man, what are you what are you doing? You're a kid. The one thing that I absolutely just can't stand is when somebody says, I don't deserve to work for God. Let me tell you something. There ain't anything you can ever do that makes you not good enough to work for God. Nothing. What could you have done that makes it so that he cannot use you? We heard a speaker one time. He said, man, I just feel like I'm always living in this cave. There's a cave of darkness around me. I just, I can't get out of it. I cry, I plead, I pray. No matter what I do, I cannot get out of this cave. And I don't know what to do to get out of the cave. And this guy said, God does some of his best work in caves. He put you in a cave. You're there. Open your eyes. It's not just darkness. I can't imagine anything that anybody, and again, you can stand back there and you can say, hey, well, Robert, you know what, man, that's great up there on the stage. You don't understand a thing about my life. You don't know what I'm going through, what I've gone through, what I've done, where I've been. You don't know the people I've talked to, the people I ain't talked to. You have no idea who I am. You know what I do know? When you accept Christ as your personal Savior, that's the first day of your life. Amen. Nothing else matters. What else matters after that? Or you just kind of carry it around so we can feel sorry for ourselves. Or use it as an excuse to not do something. I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is that he's got a message and a purpose for all of us. And his dying on the cross took that excuse away. We can no longer say, we can, we can no longer say, I'm not good enough. If there's anybody here that feels like you're not good enough to work for Christ, I really, really, really suggest that you ask him. Ask him what it is that you could have done that makes it so that you're not worthy to work for him. Because that's what he wants. What is something that you've done in the past is something that I need to hear a testimony about because I'm going through it. And there you sit, having gone through it. And maybe you're thinking, man, you know, I did that. I know how you feel. I know how you feel, brother. And uh, you're going to get through it because it took me a couple of years, but I got through it. Yeah, I got through it. What if I need to hear that? That's, that's an awful thing to keep to yourself just because it eats you alive. 
But what if somebody right beside you, sitting right beside you, says, man, I really need to hear God today. And you're going, I'm embarrassed when I can say that thing. Not this man. I don't mean like you're going to go up to somebody that you're just sitting next to and go, I kicked the puppy when I was dead. Because they're going to look at you and go, I kicked lots of puppies. Well, I mean if you're sitting next to Dave. That's my favorite. What I'm saying is, we've all done things. We've all not lived a perfect life. Uh, There's nobody in here who's as good as God. Right? I also know that a lot of times what happens is that we talk ourselves out of being able to work for Him because of something that's happened in our past. And that's tough. Because that's Satan. It's a little shorter. Remember the cartoon? What was the cartoon? That little guy on one shoulder going, eat the hot dog, eat the hot dog. And the other guy's going, don't eat the hot dog, it's full of preservatives. You remember that? Guy? Nobody remembers that, do they? Yeah. It was something like that. It might have been a hot dog thing. You got this little guy on your shoulder going, do this, do this. No, don't. you need to do this. And the other one's going, don't do that because if you do that, you're going to get in trouble. And one ends up tied up and thrown off a bed or something. But the point is, you're always going to have that. You're always going to have somebody in your ear saying, you can't do that. If it's not a physical person, it's going to be Satan. And it's going to be telling you, you're not good enough. Don't you get on that stage up there and act like you're all self-righteous and you've got it going on telling other people they need to work for God. What have you done for God? Look at your neighbor and say, what have you done for God? What have you done for God? Now look at each other and say, that, say it in this vein. Now, now use this as an attitude. Same question. Look at your neighbor and say, what have you done for God? <laughs> don't you kind of feel like sometimes people can look at you and say, I don't know where you're getting off being so high and mighty. I saw you buying girl shoes at the Payless the other day. <laughs> what have you done for God? And he's like, well, you must have seen me coming out of the liquor store when you were sawing me from across the payless. Right? Wrong. And it turns into this whole, what have you done? What have you done? Look what I've done. Who cares what you've done? God is the only one that matters when you're trying to work for God. Amen? Amen. Is this resonating at all with anybody? Is there anybody sitting here today going, you know, there is more stuff that I would like to do for God. I would like to do something for God. What is it? You know, Sister Dina standing up here today and saying, we need helpers, we need helpers, we need helpers. We do need helpers. You know how many churches there are today, I mean, like this day, today, that there's people standing up on the stage right now, and because they're doing what they want to do, they're doing it. And because they feel that that's what God's calling them to do, they're doing it. And here we sit in this church, among the most loving people that I've ever been around in the church, and there's people here that will work their tails off. And we're only a small group. There's churches with 900 people right now that can't get 20 people to run their children's environment. And what's up with that? Why are they going? I mean, I don't know anybody here that won't do what's need to be done in order for God to be furthered. Right? That's an awesome feeling. But well, what if somebody's sitting here today, and I'm going to tell you right now, there is. And I say this very, very cautiously, because, again, I'm not the pastor. But I'm going to tell you right now that all morning long, and it's been tearing me out, there's somebody here, and I don't need anybody to raise hands, I don't need any of that stuff to go on. I'm telling you right now, there's somebody in here today, right now, who feels like they're not good enough to do what it is that God's calling them to do, and they're battling that, and they're saying to themselves, I'd love to do that, but, but, I cannot do it. Because if I do, someone's going to find out about something I've done in my past. This right here says that does not matter. I'm talking to you directly, whoever you are. I'm just feeling that. I'm telling you. This right here says that excuse is over. It's over. Here's the part where I'm going to make people wrong and angry at me. What stops people from their calling? Knowing it, 
Knowing what your calling is is a huge step. What stops people? What's one big thing that stops people? Us. People. Ever hear somebody go, I'd love to go to church, I just don't like these guys. <laughs> like we ain't been at all church. Our church is rotten. We love our people. But because they've been someplace where somebody's done something to them or hurt them in some fashion, they're never going to walk in these doors. And you can talk to your brother in the face about how good our pastor is and how good he, he worships the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, I've not seen a pastor that's done that to that extent. This man will stop where he's at in his tracks and pray if that's what God tells him to do. There isn't any agenda. There isn't any, I'm going to do this because uh, we've got to be on the... Uh, you know, we got to be out of here by 12 o'clock. You know, i got hot dogs cooking. we got to cook out there. I mean, that ain't going to happen at this church. And that kills me that people won't come here because they've been other places that that hasn't happened. I'm going to tell you a story. There's a story of a, a young family looking for a church. And what happened is they went in there. They had a young boy, seven, eight years old. And they put him in the youth program. And this was a fairly big church. This big church... Um, there was a very famous rock band that came out of this church, as a matter of fact. They still perform there, and this is a true story. He got to start hanging out with these kids and thinking they were pretty cool, and we were getting settled into the church and all that good stuff, a little family. And they started making fun of this kid because of, he was different somehow. Oh, you don't play music? Yeah, and he heard them, literally heard them talking behind his back at the church, these other kids. Now, if someone's in your face going, Emily, you look awesome today. I'm so glad you're here. And then you turn around and I'm going, hey, Rick, I wish you hadn't come today. Is that a shirt? <laughs> Not real. <laughs> What's going to happen? You're going you're gonna to say to yourself, what a hypocrite. There's a lot of them, isn't there? I'm not passing judgment. I'm just telling it like it is. There's people that will tell you to your face, I'm glad they already see you here. And then they'll turn around and they'll say, man, I wish that guy hadn't shown up today. And I'm sorry. I'm not saying it's happening here in this church, but that happens in churches every day. And it affects us in a big manner as the body of Christ. Because if we're not moving in a way where everything works together, then obviously something's working against the body of Christ. I pray that's not us. Uh, people stop people sometimes from coming to church. And by coming to church, I mean people that will tell you, I've been to four churches, I can't find what I like. I don't like church. I go in there, everybody's fake. The music's going, I don't like this kind of music. I don't like this. Well, I went in there, I couldn't find a parking space. I, I walked in and nobody handed me a cup of coffee, said good morning, wanted to hear my life story in two minutes. Or I went into a church and everyone wanted to know my life story in two minutes. <laughs> Both will stop people from being involved in your church. Because it's fake. I mean, do you ever walk up to somebody that you just met and go, hey, it's nice to meet you. Now listen, how many times you've been married, I need to know this, and he does this, and he does know this. No. Oh. We just need to open our hearts to people. And I'm going to tell you, when that kid got made fun of at that church, he was eight, nine years old. People talking behind his back. That, that kid was Kevin, my son. And I'm just going to say this, because it's been on my mind. If that's you, if you're somebody who has something to say about everything somebody does, if you're one of those that in the mornings on Sundays you're glad they're there, but during the week you're telling people, I don't have the time of day for this dude, or this guy's doing this, or this girl's doing that. Can I just say, honestly, from my heart, even if you get mad at me, stop it. Because that kid's going to grow up to be 22 years old, looking for direction, and nothing you say to him is going to get him into a church like this. Nothing. Because he looks and he says, hypocrite. I went there. I've seen that. I got the I'm all about God t-shirt. But I haven't met anybody that's really all about God yet. And then we're just another family saying, no man, I'll tell you, this one's different. This one's different. 
You need to come. You need to experience this. That's hard. You know, have you ever been online and like, <laughs> this, if you've done this, it's kind of weird actually. Have you ever gone to Google and put in um, area support group? Just leave it open ended. <clears throat> so put in like Indianapolis support group. And you're going to pull up stuff for like, I was addicted to mints. <laughs> and I went to a meeting. And they told me that mints are okay. And so now I want to start a support group for those who love mints. I know, right? Google it, pal. It's there. <laughs> there are support groups for everything under the sun, are there not? I mean, if you stub your toe and you can't stop the bleeding, go on and Google Bleeding Toe Support Group, and you're going to pull up people with different color band-aids you can put on it, and I don't have them here. You know, it, I mean, it's there. It's ridiculous how many support groups there are. And yet there's people that seek these support groups, seek, 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 and they're like, I wish there was a place where I could go and get support about God. And I'm like, it's church. Church is a support group. And I know people, I know people, I know people that say, I can't find a church I like. I don't like where, where this one's located. I don't like their music. I don't like this. I don't like that. And we're like, what are you looking for? You're not looking for a church. Have you ever heard that? Like you walk up to somebody, hey, how are you? You know, we did the walk around thing for Saturday night service. And met a young lady there with her kid out in the driveway. And she said, oh, thank you. We've been here six months. We're looking for a church. That's perfect. And I got to think about that later. And, you know, our standard response is, well, we're at 2991 East Troy Avenue across from Cheddar Shank Golf Course. We've got blah, 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 blah. And she's like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, exactly. Let me tell you, they ain't looking for a church. How many, do, how many churches are in this area? Ten? Ray drives here. We got people that drive here every day and pass. How many churches to get here? They're not looking for a church, and yet that's what we go to. They said, "Well, I'm looking for a church." Well, we have a church. We got a church. Let me tell you about my church. My church is in a building, and blah blah. You know, they don't care about that stuff. And I thought my answer should have been when she said, "Our family's looking for a church." I should have said. Are you looking for a church or are you looking for a place where godly people may talk about God and how good he is? Because that's what we've got. And I don't care if we're meeting in that parking lot out there. If we're talking about God, we're the, we're the body of Christ. And people get so hung up on that. Well, we don't have a church building. Uh, we, we don't do this. We don't do that. Well, I'll go when you do. Tell me when you do. When you guys get the, the building up and ready, you let me know, and I'll be happy to come to church and I'll worship God. Let me tell you, that ain't worshiping God. That's worshiping something. That's worshiping a thing. <coughs> and if God ain't there, then it is just a thing. It's hard to think about when you talk to somebody and they're going. It just, and you hear it so much. I'm looking for a church. We're looking for a church. Well, they ain't hard to find. Some of them have steeples. Most of them have like a cross on the front. You know, I'll email you a couple pictures and you can pick the one you like. And if God's there, awesome. And if he's not, then you can leave and go tell everybody about the church you went to where God just wasn't there. And it's just a big cycle down. Let's uplift the community. Let's uplift things. This church is awesome with that. Man, the, the worship here and, and the pouring out of the spirit in this church even today. I mean, I was practically in tears back here this morning. I couldn't even know how I was going to come here and talk about this stuff today because it's like... Man, I just, I dread missing opportunities. I dread it. I hate thinking that I'm not going to say something somebody needs to hear today. Or that you came here thinking something and this isn't what you expected. And, and that you leave and not go back because you've been to other churches where God was or was not. But it was all about the people, or the person playing the music and, and how smoothly everything was. Who was wearing ten dollars shoes? Who wasn't wearing ten dollars shoes? Just saying. I ain't saying. You <laughs> shot. Can I say one more thing about about um, judging other people? Matthew seven five says, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see the 
to take the speck out of mine. And really what that means to me is that you've got this log stuck in your eyeball. And out of your good eye, you're going, man, see what that guy's got in his eye? How could we not know what he's got in his eye? It's a log, A. B, he's winking at me constantly. There's something wrong with this guy. Or he's got a log in his eye. All right. Romans. Let's go back to Romans 1. Let me know when you're there. Say amen. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go to 1, verse 28. See, the Bible mentions judging or judgment over 160 times in the Bible. It's a point he's trying to make. It's a point where he's saying, if we would quit looking at each other and trying to figure out what's wrong with the next person, maybe we'd see what it is about ourselves we need to fix so that we can do some good while we're here. Because, you know, 70 years, 75 years, 80 years, is not a lot of time. And I don't know that many people that start when they're born to start working and doing things. Spend some time reading Revelation if you haven't done that. And I'm going to tell you, it almost scared me to read the book of Revelation. Because there's things coming and happening already that lead you to think, whoa, all right. It doesn't scare me because, because the earth is coming to an end. It scares me because there's so many people that aren't going to be going. And that's not a judgment thing, guys. God says in the Bible, in his word, if you don't know if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you're not going. And that's, that's harsh. Because I know people in my own family in that circumstance would not go. And if you think I like saying that, man, I'm telling you what, you don't know me at all. I love my family. I love my family. Romans 1, 28. Are you there? You said yes, right? All right, here we go. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind. He shut their filters off. To do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanders, God-haters. Ouch! Insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents and are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Other than that, they're okay. <laughs> although they know God's righteous decree, they do not. Uh, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Do you know somebody in your life that picks on other people behind their back? It's okay to look at them and go, hey man, we need to be stopping that. There's work to be done. We don't have time for that stuff. God says time is short. Even if it's been 2,000 years, whatever. Time is short. Let's go back to one more thing that I started with. Let's go to talents for just a moment. I'm going to flip over, okay? So I'm at uh, Romans. I believe it was 12. 12.6. Because I know there's somebody sitting here thinking, I don't have a talent, I don't know what to do. I don't know. This is something to pray about, guys. Ready? We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. Did we read this already? Yes. We did. And I want to bring it up again. Because if your faith says that you need to be doing something for God, do it. Commit that to memory, because that's important. If your gift is encouragement, encourage somebody. If your gift is teaching, teach somebody. Approach the pastor. Approach his wife. Say, what can I do in this church? Here's where I feel my gifts are. If you're not sure what your gifts are, pray on it. <coughs> we need to get busy. I um, put together a little example of judgment. I don't have any little help. So if I could ask our one of our newest, um, actually, let's have both of them come up, Mr. Rick and Mr. Mike. 
And let's give them a round of encouraging applause. You're all serious today. But I can hear that today. I thought Rob was going to be funny. All he talked about was judging people. All right, I need you guys, if you would please, to step right against that wall. Yeah, just stand there. Well, now it needs to be that one so we have more range. It is judgmental. Right now it's watching you. You know what it's saying? It's saying, snap to it, mister. Okay. This is, has anybody ever been stoned to death? And I don't mean like in the 60s, 70s, stuff. <laughs> has anybody ever been like stoned to death? Like, okay, has anybody when you were little throwing rocks at each other? We used to throw dirt bombs, little dirt things, and you'd throw them, and they'd explode on the head, and you're going, I made a pop of smoke, that's so cool. And your friend's bleeding, that kind of thing. <laughs> Was I the only one that did that, honestly? <laughs> Maybe I was the one getting thrown at, I'm not sure. All right, one way that they took care of things way back when, fairly or unfairly judged, right, was that they would get angry mobs of people together who thought that certain people had done certain things, and they would basically take them to the edge of town and kill them. That's what we'll be doing today. <laughs> What I need is this half of the church is going to be an angry mob. So when I point to you, I want you to say, Kill him! I mean, yell like you're mad. Kill him! Strike him down! Take him out! Let's try it. Ready? Go! Kill him! Strike him down! Take him out! Very good. Not yet, you have Yes, you have. <laughs> All right, this time, I want this half of the church, I want you to say, no, but I want to kill them first. All right, ready? Yeah, so can you just stay there? All right, ready? Go. No. judging, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> it's so funny that Pastor said, we're not going to stone anybody to death, because we are. <laughs> I know, what was I telling you? I'm just doing a little lawnscaping. All right, I need angry mom. One, two, three, four, five, six. I need six people. Raise your hand. Oh, the wives. Yeah, the two wives need to come up for sure. Two wives, come up. We're going to put you guys right here. Okay? Who else wants to stone them to death? Oh, yeah, you got to put them to stone them to death. So we need two more. Oh, I need four more. Three more. Um, yeah, you know what? Come up and throw a rock if you want. You guys get away from the window too. <laughs> Elmer, Mr. Elmer, would you like to come up and throw a rock? Are you sure? Okay. Becky? Oh, I will. Okay. <laughs> Pastor, would you like to throw a rock? All right. So I'm going to, one, two, three, four, five. We need one more. Larry? <laughs> There's two forms of sacrifice that are going on. One, you hear me preach. Two, you get stoned to death. Take your thing. All right. How big of a rock do you want? I want the big rock. I want the big rock. I want the big rock. This is a big one right here. Hey, I should have cut a great big one. There's a rock for you. There's a rock for you. There's a rock for you. Do you guys have blindfolds? Does everybody have a clear shot? I mean, a good look at what's going on? Yeah, there's women about to kill some men. That's pretty accurate, girl. Okay. Now, we have to do the judge thing. Do you feel that you have been well represented in today's tribunal? He's dead. 
us all women. Oh, yeah. 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 Got you on it. Wow. All right. Up against, you really seriously need to back up the window just a little bit. Yeah, we're good. All right. Are you ready? We're going to do this on three. You guys may want to turn around, too. We're going to do this on three. And I'm serious. I want you to chuck him as hard as you can. People are like, is there anybody here that hasn't been here before? Is there anybody here that hasn't been here before? David. Oh, <laughs> Oops. <laughs> That's Sunday. <laughs> Not that bad, but you're not up here, right? They're like, I'm going back to this church, dude. They were stolen people today. <laughs> We're all going to count on three. You're going to chuck him as hard as you can. One, two, three. Sorry. <laughs> right. Ready? One. Two. two. There is one disclaimer I have to place. Those of you who are without sin cast the first down. Yeah, here we go. You two need to stay up and you all are going to be some people that don't run it. How are you going to the next summer? Yeah! Instead of throwing pies, we'll throw rocks. We're going to need some bigger rocks. That's what I'm saying. Alright, you guys want to stay up here for a while before you get this time. What do you want to do? And that was close, wasn't it? It's like, it's like, the church today? I gotta tell you about this. You're gonna be on Facebook right now. I can tell you this. I almost got stoned at the church. I'm so cool. They were gonna kill me. I'm serious. That's a fact. That's a fact. Yeah. yeah. Alright, I wanna close with this. Donut guy. Don't be the donut guy. Here's the donut guy. You get a bunch of people together. And you're working at someone's house doing a service project. You're supposed to meet at 7. It's 10. You're just about done, but you're taking a break. And here comes who? The donut guy. The donut guy. And he comes in and he says, Man, that traffic was horrible. Can you believe all that traffic? What are you guys doing, man? Well, oh, oh, you're almost done? And you guys are like, Man, the work's already done. It was like nine tenths of the way done. What are you doing? And you're like, man, the work's done. We ain't no donuts now. We're going to go out and get some steak and shake or something. <laughs> so here's what happens. You go through this life, and you're sitting there talking to all the people in heaven that you'd love to talk to. That you think right now, man, if I can talk to somebody in heaven, I'm going to find this guy. So you're going to find Jesus, maybe Peter, Paul, those guys. You're sitting around, you're talking, and you're going, man, what was up with that time that you did this? And here he comes. Who? The donut guy. And the donut guy comes in and he's like, Can you believe that life? Man, that life was horrible. It took me three hours to turn 90. It was horrible. I couldn't believe it. And you guys are like, Man, we're sitting here with Paul and all these guys, Jesus here, we're trying to talk, and here you come in late. I mean, the work's already done. Ooh, ouch. We've already done all the work. And he's like, I brought donuts. And you're like, now we're in heaven. We don't eat donuts. <laughs> we don't eat donuts in heaven. I mean, I'm sure they're there. There's got to be a certain corner of heaven that says, get your donuts here because they're just that good. But you don't walk into heaven going, I brought donuts because I was three hours late to a two-hour party. <laughs> I don't want to be the donut guy. I don't want to get to heaven and say, I'm here, what can we do? And have all my brothers and sisters looking at me going, man, you missed it, dude. The work's already done. Work's gone. It's done. Is there anything else you can do now? Where were you? I'm stuck in life. How are we all? I think what we need to do is just reflect and say, how much can we do? Why are we doing it? And don't let anybody or anything tell you you cannot do it. That's not like a big pet speech where you go in there going, you can change your life. You literally can change your life. And you can do a lot of good. 
So, Father, let's go ahead and pray. You need to pray us out with you, too. Okay. Father God, we're just so thankful for each and every opportunity that you give us. Help us not to miss them, pass them up, Lord. Help us to just be kinder and gentler to each other. Help us to lift each other up in our encouragement, Lord. Help us to help us to let others know that they can be worth of something and that it's good for you and that, and that it should be all yours. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes to what it is that we're doing that might be holding a brother or a sister down and not us to do anything that would cause a brother to stumble. Help us to have kinder spirits, kinder hearts. Let us help those who need help. Lord, I pray for the lost, that they would be found and, and brought to you. And I pray for the found. I pray that we would continue doing what you ask us to do each and every day. In your loving Son's name I pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Yes. We just wanted to, we had to show you this. This was, this is just priceless. And um, we don't normally have this many children, so it came together so well. Um, so we wanted, wanted to be able to show you all. Here, we need to open this up, Kevin. Shelby, can you get them lined up? Uh, we need the seven and six year old in the back row, remember? Where you stand? We haven't done this way more. So we can see you. Okay, I'm getting a quick, I'm going to turn you around and introduce you. This is, these are our two leaders. We call them Chris and I. Thank you, David. Are you guys in line like you should be? Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Ready? I'm going to put the mic down, so we're going to be over here. Everybody can see you guys. Be ready? Let's do it. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.